Good morning. It certainly is good to see everyone here this morning. We want to welcome everyone to our Sunday morning worship services here at the Oxford Church of Christ. If you're visiting with us this morning, you've not done so already, I encourage you to take a few moments, fill out a visitor's card. You should be able to find one of those in the pew in front of you. If you don't mind, just fill that out. Put the collection plate as it passes this morning so we might have a record of your visit. This morning we have several announcements that we need to make. Uh, Sandra Coffin is, uh, is in the hospital at UAB in room 7207. Uh, a couple of days ago Sandra was having uh, intense pain and contacted her doctor and they sent her to UAB for a scan and unfortunately her cancer is back. And uh, they've got her in the hospital now, trying to manage her pain, and as soon as they get that kind of under control, she's going to get to come home, hopefully maybe today. Uh, and then, of course, she'll have to be scheduled uh, for treatments, and of course, we'll have some more information of that once uh, she goes back to her doctor. Uh, but uh, I talked to Sandra for a few moments this morning. Uh, she was a little weak, of course, as you can imagine, and uh, of course they've got her on some pretty strong pain medicine, uh, but she wanted to let everyone know how much she loved them, how much she appreciates everybody's prayers in the past of her battle with cancer, and request that we all pray for her and for her upcoming treatments that she's going to have to be uh, going through here very soon. And we also want to remember Buddy. Buddy is over there with her, and he's been staying with her uh, since she went to the hospital. So we want to remember Buddy, too, because he's right there giving Sandra uh, support each and every day. We also want to remember uh, Ellen Claiborne, Lenore's mother, and, uh, of course, Lenore's family. Uh, Ellen, of course, is extremely ill at this time, and uh, uh, this just seemed like I talked to Mike a while ago, just a matter of time. So we want to continue to remember that family our prayers as they go through this very stressful time uh, with uh, Ellen. Also, uh, Joyce Hicks, a uh, friend of uh, Ray Nelson's, fell, and she is in Piedmont Rehab, so we want to remember Joyce Hicks in our prayers as well. Also, uh, Cliff Chanel's grandfather, Frank Bingham, uh, and of course Cliff is Marie's husband, uh, and uh, his grandfather, Frank Bingham, died Friday. Tuscaloosa arrangements are being made for that. So we want to remember that family in our prayers as well over the loss of uh, Mr. Bingham. I'd like to uh, thank everyone uh, for their participation and support of our trunk or treat uh, uh, yesterday. Uh, it was really great and a big success. I want to remind the ladies that uh, the ladies' devotional is uh, tomorrow evening at the home of Wanda Pettis. If you've not done so already, there is a sign-up sheet and make your plans to be part of that tomorrow evening. Also, Team 2 members, uh, don't forget to give your $10 to Leslie today for the shower. Also, the time changes next weekend as uh, daylight savings times ends. Don't forget to change your clocks back. And also, next Sunday, our time for our evening services will start at 1.30 next Sunday. So don't forget that as well. Also next Sunday, uh, Fall Frenzy is scheduled uh, at the home of the Bensons, and that's going to start at 3 o'clock next Sunday afternoon. Mike will need to meet with all the deacons uh, this evening, immediately following our evening service in the ladies' classroom. So deacons, please make your way to the ladies' classroom this evening after services for a brief meeting with Mike. Also want to remind everyone that our Child Haven Thanksgiving Appeal is coming up next month where we'll have a special contribution on November the 11th. Our goal is $3,000, so please make your plans on being a part of that. Also, there's a baby shower scheduled for Allison Ward. That's also coming up November the 11th, and that'll be from 2.30 to 4 o'clock. Birthdays and anniversaries. Uh, Andrew Adams has a birthday coming up on November the 2nd. I want to wish him a happy birthday. And MC and Gene White's anniversary is also of November the 2nd. I have a card I'd like to read at this time. Thank you so much for the basket of snacks. I appreciate you thinking of me while I'm away at college. Kayla Huckabee. And that card will be posted on the bulletin board in the hallway to my right. 
Our order of services this morning, Ronnie Nordan will be leading us to open in prayer in just a few moments. Clay Blackwell will be directing our song service. At the proper time, Mike Benson will present our message. And then at the end of services, Robert Burleson will lead us in a closing prayer. At this time, we're going to ask Ronnie to come and lead us in our opening prayer. Let us bow our heads as we go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Our most gracious, loving, kind Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for this beautiful Lord's Day. We're thankful for this time that we can come together and worship Thee in spirit and in truth. Father, as we look out this morning, we see visitors. We pray that You would be with them and bless them as well. Be with those who are traveling. We're so thankful they're here with us today. Bring them safely home again. Father, we're also thankful of our church family here at Oxford. Father, we're thankful for all those that join in in the work here at Oxford. Father, help us always to be diligent and always looking for things to do in thy kingdom so thy kingdom will grow. Father, we're thankful for our deacons and their family as well and all the works they're involved in. Please continue to bless them. Also, we ask a blessing of wisdom, knowledge, and understanding on our elders. We're so thankful for them and their diligence in following thy word as they lead us here at Oxford. Father, help us to help them in every way possible. We're also thankful for our ministers here, Mike and Andy, as they bring thy word before us. Father, for their talents and their abilities, we're so thankful. Help us to listen tentatively, learn from thy word, so that we'll be stronger Christians in our daily walk with thee. Father, we're mindful this morning of all those that have been mentioned as being sick. We know we have no, a, a number that are in the nursing homes, those that are shut in at home. Please continue to bless them. Father, we know that we have many uh, families that are struggling with illness. Father, we are especially mindful this morning of uh, Sister Sandra Coffin as she's fighting cancer again. Father, we ask a special blessing on her, Father, be with those that are ministering unto her. Also, Sister Lenore at this time, Father, as she's there with her mother, Sister Ellen, we ask a special blessing on that family. Please put your loving arms around them and comfort them, Father, and let them know that we love them during this tough time. Father, we're also mindful of, of Joyce Hicks as well, sister, or brother Nelson's friend. Please be with her after her fall. Bring, restore her to her much wanted help. Father, also help us to remember all those that have lost loved ones recently. I know it's mentioned this morning, Cliff and his father. Father, please bless him as well and comfort him during the loss of his father. We know that there are many others in our congregation that struggle from day to day with the loss of loved ones. Help them to know that we love them and support them. Help us to show our love toward them. Father, we ask thee this morning also to bless those of our military that are not only here at home but on foreign soil. Father, continue to be with them, keep them out of harm's way as they serve our country. We're also thankful this morning of our first responders who keep us safe at home and have a number of jobs to help us to stay healthy, Father. Let them know we appreciate them as well. As we enter in this morning to worship service before thee, we pray that all worldly things will be put away from our minds, that we will concentrate on thee and thy word, that we will learn more about thee, learn more of thy love, and be able to share that love with the world around about us so that one day we'll all have a home in heaven with thee. In Christ's name we pray, amen. One additional uh, thing uh, before we have our closing prayer this morning, uh, Andy Zimmerman's going to uh, update us on our results of the trunk or treat that we had yesterday. Uh, so that'll be before we have our closing prayer. <clears throat> Number 22, 2-2. Two, two. Let's sing the first and last stanzas this morning. Let us sing. All hail the power of Jesus' name, let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him. Oh. 
song will be number 113 113 we'll sing the first and last stanzas <coughs> let us sing I need the every heart most great us Lord no tender voice like thine can be he saw Next song will be number 265. 265. We'll sing the first, third, and fifth stanzas of this song to prepare our minds to partake in the Lord's Supper this morning. <coughs> Let us sing. When my love to Christ grows weak, when for deeper faith I see, then when thought I go to thee, art and of Gethsemane, when my love for man grows weak, when for stronger faith I see. In Matthew 26, 28, and 1 Corinthians 11, 25, we find the word covenant. The word covenant is an agreement or promise. Remember when we first become Christians, we promised God we would live Christian lives. He agreed to be our father, and we agreed to be his children. When Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper, Matthew 26, 26 through 29, it was not only to remember the incredible sacrifice that he made for us, but also to create an emotional connection with him as well. Our participation in the Lord's Supper honors his sacrifice, while also granting us a connection to him unlike any other act of remembrance. Jesus lived up to his agreement by freely sacrificing himself on the cross and continues to live up to his agreement by showing his love mercy and grace each day. The Lord's Supper is a wonderful time to think about our relationship with Jesus and to ask the question, 
Are we living up to our side of the agreement with him? Let's pray and give thanks for the bread. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this bread that represents Jesus' body. And Father, we ask that you help us to partake of it in a manner that will be well-pleasing in your sight. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's again pray and give thanks for the cup. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this cup, the fruit of the vine that represents Jesus' blood. And Father, as we partake of it, help us to clear our worldly minds and partake of it in a manner that will be well-pleasing in your sight. In Jesus' name, amen.
Another item of worship is giving. We have that opportunity to do so at this time. Let's pray and give thanks. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for all the physical and spiritual blessings that you give us each day. Father, help our hearts to be in the proper place as we give back a portion to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Our song before our lesson will be number 588. 588. If you're able and willing, an opportunity to stand before our lesson. Let's sing the first and last stanzas. <clears throat> Let us sing. When God shut Noah in the grand old heart, he put a rainbow in the cloud. When the thunders rolled and the sky was dark, God put a rainbow in the cloud. God put a rainbow in the cloud. God put a rainbow in the cloud. When it looked like the sun wouldn't shine any more. God put a rainbow in the cloud. Oh, Jordan, deep and Jordan, wide. God put a rainbow in the cloud to lead his people to the other side. God put a rainbow in the cloud. God put a rainbow in the cloud. God put a rainbow in the cloud. When it looked like the sun wouldn't shine any more. If you would, turn and mark in your song books to number 348. 348 will be our song of invitation this morning. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for being with us. <clears throat> Do have some guests here today. <clears throat> Indulge me for just a minute. I, I have to tell you that a couple of things have happened to me this week that are <clears throat> profound in a positive way. One of them I want to mention 
initially as we get into our study, many of you know the majority on Wednesday nights in the auditorium, we have been studying now for about seven or eight weeks a series from the Old Testament that we call Old Testament Shadows, Old Testament Snapshots of New Testament Truth, and we study the old <clears throat> and we see salvation in the new. I'm sorry, I <clears throat> don't know what's happening to my voice. <clears throat> Excuse me. On this past Wednesday night, I, I decided to change gears somewhat as we studied what, for many of us, might be the most famous story, certainly in the Old Testament, if not in the Bible, of Noah and the ark. And we began to incrementally just look at some biblical evidence that helps us to understand faith and salvation. And what I decided to do was rather than being the lecturer in class, I asked to be the student. And I asked the people in class to ask me questions so that you could get some practice working with your courage. And number one, it would, it would help me to learn as a teacher and we were inundated with questions about Noah and the flood and the ark. And I have to tell you, that might have been the best Wednesday night class I've ever been a part of. It was, it was thrilling, it was exciting, it was relevant, it was biblical. And people not only ask questions during the class itself, but after the class, and I've received a number of questions since then, and I did something that I rarely, rarely do, but the plans I had for this morning I changed because the fire is hot. This Wednesday night is singing night and we'll not be studying it, but Lord willing, the following week we will. I'm going to ask you to turn with me in your Bibles to Genesis chapters 5, 6, and 7. Clay, thank you again for leading us in a song to introduce our study. And if you'll be again with us tonight at 5 o'clock, um, we're going to continue this study at least tonight. And depending upon how the church family responds, we might even do some more, some more study. I hear this communication from my peers quite often. And I hear terms and terminology used in the context of despair and almost in the context of fear. Because here are the words that I hear, and I'll just say the word and you experience the feeling, the emotion. They're negative. Abortion. And homosexual marriage and terrorism, and atheism, atheism, and crime. And we look at the world around us, and we shake our heads, and you tell me if I'm wrong, and we say to ourselves, if not just inwardly, sometimes even outwardly, and we say, how long will it be when, as we look at the sin that is in the world, and we say to ourselves, when will God's patience come to an end? When will God say, it's today? And our challenge as children of God is to live in the world and not be of the world, not to be tainted by the world's sin. And that's our perennial struggle. Well, I want to share with you somebody in the Bible who lived in a world where he was quite literally, <laughs> he, was a, he was an island of righteousness in a world 
No, in an ocean of iniquity. And when you talk about how bad things are today, I want you to think of it in the context of this particular man. If your Bible is open with me to Genesis, look with me in chapter 6 and verse 9, and I want you to notice <clears throat> three things that you'll underscore in your Bible about him. This is the genealogy of Noah, and it says, first of all, Noah was a just man. J-U-S-T, if you have your pen handy in the margin of your Bible, the word just here means essentially he's an honest man in a world of dishonesty. Imagine that. But secondly, he says not only was Noah a just man, but he was perfect in his generations. Now, you and I know perfect can't mean perfect in the context of sinless. But it does mean that he is devoted to God and he is mature. He is probably the best way to see this word perfect in his generations is he is completely devoted to God. In a world where everybody is completely antagonistic toward God. Back up to verse 5. The Lord saw... The <coughs> excuse me, the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And so Noah is first a just man, secondly he's a perfect man, and Noah thirdly walked with God. Now how can he walk with God? And the answer is because he's a patriarch, patri father. God spoke to Noah directly. God speaks to us this way. God spoke to Noah this way. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so Noah is a bright and shining star in a universe of darkness. He's a just man. He's a perfect man. He is walking with God. And you say, Mike, how is that relevant? Because nearly 5,000 years later, people are still struggling with Noah and the ark and the flood. And I'm not surprised, quite frankly. I'm, not, I'm, I'm just not. I'm not surprised when, could, uh, when those in the educational world come to the conclusion that Noah is not historical. In fact, they will tell you that the first 11 chapters of the Bible are just mythology. From the creation of the world to the history of man to the, to the Tower of Babel to Noah and the Ark, they'll say that's just mythology. And I'm not surprised when I, when I read that and when I learn that. What does surprise me at times is when sometimes some of God's people communicate that and I hear someone say the flood and Noah could have never happened. When someone says there is no way that story could be real. That that is a story about the power of God but it's not historically accurate so we're told. Now here's what I want to do in the next 25 minutes or less. Number one, I want to notice two allegations, and they're negative in nature, and then we'll respond to those allegations from the Word of God. Number two, we're going to look at a divine <clears throat> illustration from God and God's Word, and then second, or thirdly, we're going to make some application to you and I today and to what it means to us. <clears throat> Number one, as we think about allegations, here is a, a predominant allegation that is made against this story, and it goes something like this. The reason that we know that Noah, we're told, that Noah and the story of the ark and the flood, but Noah in particular cannot be true, we're told, is because Noah allegedly wasn't smart enough to build an ark. And you say, well, where's this coming from? Here's essentially the idea that the further that we go back into antiquity, 
the, the, the world would tell us this, that essentially early man was a long-armed, ape-like individual who lived in caves, that he was uneducated, obviously, because he couldn't be educated. And so they say, well, obviously, Noah lived, if he lived, couldn't have been educated enough to build something like an ark. I want you to do something with me. Back up a couple of pages in your Bible in Genesis chapter 2, and I want you to read Let's begin at verse 19. Let's look at 19 and 20. <clears throat> and I want you to notice what's happening here because we're going we're gonna to take this and move this further uh, as we get to the story of Noah. Out of the ground, the Lord, God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam. Now, here's what's happening. Watch it carefully, everybody. Stay with me now. God's going to parade the totality of creation before the eyes of Adam, before the creation of Eve. And he brings them to Adam to see what he, Adam, would call them. Adam has the responsibility of naming all of those animals. Now question, why would you name them? Because... In subsequent generations, you want people to know what they're called. And whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. So Adam gave names to the cattle, to the birds of the air, to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a help or comparable to him. Now watch it. God's communicating with Adam. Adam is communicating with God. Adam is choosing and selecting the names of all of this plethora of animals. Now, if you ask any scientist in the world today, if you ask them, what is the essential factor or factors that differentiates an animal between humanity, and they would tell you the highest form indicator of intelligence is the ability to communicate. The evolutionist says... Man couldn't communicate, but in, in, in grunts. Now, but what is he doing here? He's naming animals. He's remembering those names. He is communicating with God, and when his wife is created, he is communicating with her. Now, turn a page in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 4. In Genesis chapter 4... <clears throat> I want you to notice a couple of pieces of information here. We, we are introduced to a couple of people here in verse 21. His brother's name was Jubal. Well, who is Jubal? He is the father of all those who play the harp and the flute. We have instruments that are being created and played a few generations from Adam. Intelligence. Verse 22, and as for Zillah, she also bore Tubal-Cain. Well, why is that name important? Because it says here in verse 22, he is an instructor of every craftsman in bronze and iron. So here in the shadow, if you please, of creation, we have the creation of instruments, we have the playing of instruments, we have the fashioning of metallurgy, we have memory, and we have communication. And so when someone says... There is no way the story of Noah could be true because allegedly Noah isn't intelligent enough. We're in the shadow of creation itself. And we have communication, we have memory, we have the creation of instruments and the playing of instruments and songs. And we're making metals, we're making tools. And so when someone says, well, he couldn't have been smart enough. He's not this ignorant, dumb, unlearned individual as he is portrayed. And I might just ask this on a side note. What about the pyramids? What about the Sphinx? Those were created by man. And we still don't know how they did that. What about mummification? 
Here's allegation number two. They would say, well, number one, Noah wasn't smart enough. Number two, the ark wasn't big enough to accommodate all of those animals. Now, look with me in Genesis chapter 6. And if you've not already done so, mark verse 15. Thank you for turning. <clears throat> verse 15 this is how you, God said, shall make it. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, its width 50 cubits, and its height 30 cubits. If we're going to translate that into measurements that, that we're acquainted with, we're thinking that the ark is approximately the length of one and a half football fields. It's 450 feet long. It's approximately 75 feet wide with three decks and 45 feet tall. Now, someone says, well, <clears throat> so I'm told that <clears throat> in academia that the ark's not going to be able to hold all of the different animals that we have in the world today. Now, here's one thing I want you to notice. Just think about it. Noah didn't take poodles and dachshunds and greyhounds. He took dogs. I have a book in my study. It's written by <clears throat> two men whose last name is Whitcomb and Morris, and they've written the definitive book. In fact, the book is called The Genesis Flood, and I want you to hear what they say. Here's what they say, for the sake of realism, imagine waiting, we can do this, at a railroad crossing while 10 freight trains, 10 freight trains, each pulling 52 boxcars, move slowly one by another. This is how much space was available on the ark. In terms of its capacity, we're talking about 520 modern railroad stock cars. Now, look at Genesis chapter 6 and verse 14. <clears throat> Make yourself an ark, and we know the dimensions of the ark at verse 15, an ark of gopher wood with rooms in the ark. And so we've got compartments all over this huge football and a half field barge. I'm told, I've not seen pictures of it, <clears throat> you might help me find it today. The SS Jeremiah O'Brien was built during World War II. It was launched in the latter part of the war in 43. It was constructed to carry wartime supplies. The ship measured 441 feet long. It's nine feet shorter than the ark. It's 56 feet wide, so it's what? Mm, 25, 29 feet not as wide, it could displace 14,000 tons of goods when it's fully loaded. 14,000 tons. Now here's what Whitcomb and Moore says. With its thousands of built compartments and rooms, the ark would have been sufficiently large enough to carry two of every species of air-breathing animals in the world today and use only half of its deck space. The remaining space would have been occupied by Noah's family, his additional representatives. Remember, he takes two of every animal, but we take seven of some animals for sacrifice and for food and for the propagation of the species. Number one, let's look at the allegations. And so when someone says, well, Noah wasn't smart enough, well, from the very beginning of time, we've got the man who's able to communicate with God, who's able to think, who's able to name. We have the creation of instruments, the plane of instruments. We have metallurgy, so he's smart enough. When someone says, well, the ark wasn't big enough, well, we're talking about 450 boxcars. Now, go with me in your Bible to the New Testament to Matthew chapter 24. Someone said, Mike, I thought we were studying in the Old Testament. We were studying Noah. We are. <clears throat> I don't have time this morning. <clears throat> At some point in the future, I certainly am going to do this, <clears throat> to study this thorny chapter. <clears throat> In 
In Matthew chapter 24, in the last half of the chapter, I want you to notice how Jesus, in, listen, how Jesus interpreted the Genesis account. And I want to make three observations. Number one, verse 36 says, but of that day, the day of judgment, the end of the world. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, but my Father only. When's that day going to come? Well, it, it is going to come. But now watch verse 40, 37, 38, 39. But as the days of Noah were, who's Jesus quoting? He's quoting Moses' words of Noah in Genesis. But as the days of Noah were, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man. Now watch what he's saying here. Jesus goes back to antiquity. And I have to be careful. Stay with me for a second. We talk about the Old Testament and the New Testament. When Jesus talked about Scripture, it was Holy Scripture. The New Testament's not been written yet. And he goes back into Scripture, and he says, watch it. For as in the days before the flood, now watch what Jesus tells me here. Number one, Jesus says Genesis is legitimate, accurate, historical. He says Noah really did live and the flood really did happen. They were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. They were engaged in the normal activities of life until the day that Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So it will be the coming of the Son of Man. Now let me make two or three observations here. Number one, Jesus knew about this catastrophic event and everybody else listening to Jesus knew it too. They said, yeah, that's what the Bible says. They knew that it was unexpected. They knew that it involved total destruction of the world. Number two, Jesus talks about the normal activities of people. How many people in Noah's day are thinking, you know what, we got to get ready because we've been, they can't. They see the ark, but there's never been a drop of rain on the earth prior to that occasion. But I want you to think about this. We have a luxury in some context, which is very unusual, when the, when the last hurricane happened, we know for days ahead of time the hurricane's happening, but typically, typically when a catastrophe hits your home, how much time do you know ahead of time that it's happening? How much of an announcement do you get before the tornado takes your house? How much time do you know before the fire consumes the house? Well, watch what Jesus is saying here. Everybody listening to the sound of my voice who is listening to Jesus says, "Uh uh-huh, we're we're acquainted with the Old Testament. We know the ark was true. We know that Noah really did live. We know that there was a universal or at least a worldwide flood, and it caught people unexpectedly. Jesus says, just as it was then, it's exactly what it's going to be like at the end of time. Now look at chapter, go back with me back to Genesis again. To Genesis chapter 7. Verse 15, and they went into the ark to Noah two by two of all flesh, and which is the breath of life. So those that entered male and female of all flesh went in as God had commanded him, and the Lord shut them in. Now the <clears throat> flood was on the earth 40 days. The waters increased and lifted up the ark, and it rose high above the earth. And the waters prevailed and greatly increased on the earth. When the ark moved on the surface of the waters and the waters prevailed exceedingly on the earth and the high hills under the whole heaven were covered. The waters prevailed 15 cubits upward 
and the mountains were covered, verse 21, all flesh that died, all flesh died that moved on the earth, birds, cattle, beasts, every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, and every man. Where was the dry place on the earth? only in the ark and Jesus teaches a lesson on the end of time by going to what appeared to be the end of time then and he said this the end was foreshadowed there and everybody listening to the voice of Jesus would have to make this admission. We know that scripture is accurate. We know that Noah lived. We know that he built an ark. And we know there was a worldwide flood that killed everybody on the planet except the folks in the ark. Noah, his wife, his sons and their wives. Eight people. Now, here's my point. Here's the illustration. See, Jesus, to teach the reality of it, says this. He says, he uses Noah as a divine illustration to teach us today. If Noah wasn't accurate, if Noah was just a, a moral story, if Noah wasn't historical, then what Jesus said to those people made no sense whatsoever. And Jesus was a liar. And if I cannot trust Jesus Christ to tell me the truth about the destruction of the world, how can I trust Jesus to tell me the truth about the salvation of my soul? How can I trust Jesus to tell me the truth on any subject if I can't trust him about the flood? Now that brings me to two points. And the lesson are going to be yours. And I want you to listen to both, if you would please, kindly. The unbeliever, the skeptic, the academician, they interpret the Bible through the lens, listen to me, young people, through the lens of observable science. Now, science is not a bad thing. Can I say this? Science is God's idea. But here's the problem, is man does this, <clears throat> the scientist, the skeptic does this, they say, well, here is what you believe, and they interpret scripture through what they can observe. What's the problem with that? Is that much of what happens, or at least some of what happens in the Bible, cannot be measured through the eyes of science? How do you measure a resurrection from the dead? We were talking about John chapter 9 in Bible class. How do you heal somebody who is born blind? How do you measure the miraculous? You can't because miracles, by, them, by their very nature, are outside the normal affairs that God put into order at the beginning of the world. And so the world says, oh, I can't believe in Noah and the ark. I can't believe in Adam. Why is that? Because it, I, I can't measure it, and so it must therefore be a fable. Wouldn't it make much more sense, and doesn't it make much more sense, rather than interpreting the Bible through the lens of science, to interpret science through the lens of the Bible? Now, one of the things we're going to talk about, Lord willing, at 5 o'clock today, is we're going to talk about the dinosaurs. The question that I was asked over and over and over again Wednesday night, just not once, but on several occasions, is folks said, well, wait a minute, where did the dinosaurs fit into this whole scheme here? Because as we shall see, we've got bones scattered all over the world in deposits, fossils. And what the world says about what happened and what the Bible says. And what I find out is that the Bible's been telling me the truth all along. Now let me make a, a, another observation. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you to turn to two more passages. 
and our time's going to come to a conclusion. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 10. And you say, well, Mike, why are we going back to Matthew? Because I want to make maybe the most profound point that I know how tonight or this morning. Matthew chapter 10. Thank you, everybody, for turning. Jesus looked those people in the eye and quoted to them and mentioned an Old Testament story that every Jew would have been acquainted with. And as I said a moment ago, everybody listening to his voice would agree they knew that to be historically accurate. If I can't trust Jesus to tell me the truth about the flood and by the way he's talking there in Matthew's account about ultimately the destruction of the world not by water but by fire how can I trust him to tell me the truth about the destruction of my soul Jesus said and do not fear those look at verse 28 who kill the body but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both body and soul in hell. You know what? I've got a note in the margin of my Bible here. Jesus was the theologian on the subject of eternal hell. And if I necessarily believe in the destruction of the world in Noah's day by water, then doesn't it stand to reason that I must also believe in the destruction of the world at the end of time by fire? Yeah. See, ultimately what I have to ask is do I trust Jesus? I began this morning by telling you that there were two things that happened to me this week that impacted me and one changed my mind about my sermon or sermons Thursday I got a call from my father-in-law who said that Ellen had fallen and she was spitting up blood And they took her by ambulance to the hospital there in Dalton. Thursday, we decided that we would drive to Dalton. And when we got there, I met with Dad, I met with Lucian, and he said it's just a matter of time. And we started calling the family in because our anticipation was that Ellen had hours. And Saturday night, I'm with the family, and I, I feel an obligation, and then you'll understand this, as the gospel preacher to say, what are we going to do about worship tomorrow morning? And Lucian said, Let's worship together. So the sisters and the brothers-in-law and the grandchildren went to the third floor in thir room 321. And we opened the door and we went around the bed. And for 45 minutes, we just sang hymns from memory. And I say we sang because much of that time we couldn't sing. Because every song reminded us of our love for that special Christian lady. And for the last time in her life, we observed the Lord's Supper with Ellen while she was conscious. And she took the bread and she drank the contents of that cup. And I, 
I read, I didn't preach, I read from Proverbs 31 of the worthy woman, and we wept. And I got to thinking, I got to thinking, what does that little piece of bread mean? And what does the contents of that little cup mean? Because if you go to 1 Corinthians, I am to eat that bread and drink that cup till he comes again to take his family home. See, what we do as a spiritual family is when we come together, death is not the end. For the child of God, it's the thing that we're looking forward to. And when we drink the contents of the cup and when we eat the cup, when we eat that little piece of bread, it reminds me that Jesus Christ died for my sins and that I'm a sinner. And it reminds me that when my body is taken into eternity and I turn into dust, that Jesus Christ is responsible and he's going to send angels to take my soul to be in eternal heaven. And when I'm drinking that cup, it's not just simply something that I go through. It has meaning to me. It tells me that there was a day back in the Old Testament, but it tells me there's a day today when Jesus is coming again. And I can weep tears of joy with my loved ones because that sister, that member of my family has the promise of eternal life. I don't want us ever to rush out of the building and say we've been, we've done our worship. We have to remember there's implications of what we believe. And see, the question that ought to permeate, permeate every heart right now is not, where are we going to eat the buffet? But is my heart right with God? If you're not a child of God, there's a judgment day. I don't know when it's going to be. And neither did the people of the Old Testament. But I do know this. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, Enter in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it, because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way that leads to life. Listen, and there are few who find it. Has it ever occurred to you at this moment, you know, I... I I struggle with how people remember a sermon. Has it, has it ever occurred to you that this could be the last sermon you ever hear? This could be the last worship assembly that you're ever in? This could be the last day that your family observes the Lord's Supper with you? Are you ready for that day? Clay is going to lead us in a song if you're not a child of God. Jesus is tenderly calling. Obey the gospel. If you're a child of God and you've wandered away, return to him now. While together we stand and while we sing. Calling to.
today. You may be seated. Promise we will not keep you long. One of our shepherds asked on behalf of uh, them to give you a report of what happened yesterday. I uh, mean, you know that we held uh, here at Oxford our first trunk or treat. We've never done anything like that here. And uh, I guess from a statistical standpoint, it was a success. We at times had more people here than we knew what to do with. And by saying that, I mean our entire parking lot was full. I mean that Highway 78 in front of the building was full as far as you could see. And by the best guess of the most conservative estimate that I have, from one of our members and our beloved Dr. Vance Moore, he said he would bet that at least 2,000 people came to the parking lot yesterday. And the implications out of this, that we had 2,000 people who cannot use the excuse, I don't know where your building is because they've been to our parking lot. And we handed out invitations and we invited people to come to church services and we handed out candy and we looked at costumes. And we're excited about the possibility that there's a chance that that many could visit with us sometimes. None of them could visit with us or we could have one soul that saved because of the work we did yesterday. But I think even more exciting than the number of people that we had that visited yesterday, and I was excited. It, we, when we got ready to close down, we had to close down at 6 o'clock yesterday instead of 7 because we had so many people come through, we ran out of candy. And that's a good problem to have, that that many people come through, that we ran completely out of everything that we had to give them. We had face painting. We had hot chocolate. We ran out of everything. I believe Glenn told me that he made 500 hot dogs, and they were out within the first hour easily. They were finished within the first hour. So we, we had people come through galore. Uh, to visit with us yesterday, but just as exciting as that was, I think it was more exciting for me to see that we had 27 families represented from Oxford yesterday that brought cars to the trunk or tree and handed out candy, and we had more than that that participated in handing out hot chocolate, that prepared hot dogs, that prepared things for our guests to be here, and the best estimate I have, we didn't get a count, was that we had about 75 of our members here last night working is let the world see the light of the gospel uh, here at the Oxford Church. So we are thankful for that. You know, sometimes we live in a world that we look and we say there's no way that anybody's going to hear the gospel and there's no way that anybody's going to want to come. And, and it's very true. We may have had a lot of people come just for free candy last night. And that's a possibility that happened just like when we were at Oxford Fest. There may have been people who came to our booth because they wanted a free cup of cold water. With that being said, I'm reminded of what Paul said, and we talked about it in Bible class this morning to the Corinthians. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, be immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as you know, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. God wants us to keep pushing forward. God doesn't want us to push back. And God says everything that we do for him is always and is never in vain. So we appreciate what you do. I think the most exciting thing, like I said, was to see this church family come together to work in a way that I have not seen many church families do to try to evangelize Oxford. So thank you for what you do. Many of you have given us a suggestion for next year of things you think we can do to improve on what we did yesterday. And if you've got a suggestion, bring it because we want to do better next year than we did this year, and we want to have more people coming. I'm convinced that if we would have kept going yesterday, that we would have had another 2,000 people come through in the last hour if we wouldn't have run out. I'm convinced, and so we want everybody we can to know that this church building is here and that we want to study the Bible with you. So thank you for what you do, and thank you for who you are, and if you've got suggestions for next year, bring them to me, and let's see if we can make next year even better. Thank you. with me please our father in heaven we're extremely grateful to thee for this opportunity to come out today and hear another portion of thy word father we pray that the things that we've heard here today we may take them and apply them to our lives our lives to thy service also father we ask thee to continue to bless the sick especially the ones that were mentioned here this morning also ask thy blessing to be upon the caretakers that are taking care of them Father, we also ask thy blessings be upon those mourning loss of loved ones. Comfort them, Father, in a way that only thou knowest how. Now, Father, as we are to be dismissed, we ask these prayers back at the next appointed time. In Christ's name, amen.